uh, earlier, uh, really earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, I'd met with Jason Geary, and I just said, you know, uh, we know God's got a call on your life. How can we get you to get your credentials? And so we just kind of started the ball rolling and talking and saying, hey, we want to give you, and I, and I said, I wanted to give you some opportunities to preach this year because Jason is, he, one, he's just a good communicator, but two, you know, um, does a great job on Sunday mornings, but he has the call of God on his life. And so we just want to recognize that and give him opportunities to, to grow in the gift that God has given to him. And so a couple months ago, I had approached Jason and told him or asked him if he'd be willing to preach. And so he said, what week is my father-in-law going to be out of town in Arizona? <laughs> That's the week that I'll preach. And uh, no, just kidding. Uh, it just worked out that way, but uh, I, I just, uh, I'd ask Jason to come and share the message with us this morning. So I'm going to ask Jason if you would come forward. I want to encourage you to kind of just lean in this morning, whether it's with your phone. If you have a piece of paper, you can use the back of an offering envelope. Take a couple notes, but I know Jason's got some, some words of wisdom to share with us this morning. So uh, just open your hearts, and, and let's see what God wants to speak to us about this morning. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome, Josh. Set my timer. Uh, Josh, you just stole the first three minutes of my sermon, so way to go. Uh, no, that's all right. I was a little long anyways in my practice. So, um, yeah, so I appreciate Josh giving me the opportunity. Josh, uh, I was going to kind of walk you through essentially what Josh had done at the early part of this year essentially to uh, spur me on in uh, my activity and gifting um, along the way. And so that was part of it. But so we're going to actually going to be continuing in the Rooted series. But on Thursday morning, the Holy Spirit called an audible to me and said, uh, guess what? You had a plan for what your sermon was going to look like, and I am going to tweak it. Not only am I going to tweak it, but I'm going to go first. And so uh, so he tweaked my sermon. I let Josh know that I felt a, a special um, word coming from the Holy Spirit, but that he wanted it in sermon form in the first few minutes. And so we're going to take a slight detour right off the rooted path uh, so that I can obey what I think the Holy Spirit's calling me to do. And what it is, is that uh, we're going to be, I, wanna, I sense that the Holy Spirit wanted to communicate uh, that it is time to talk, uh, that there are either is an individual here or individuals watching that we need to address you getting in the game with your spiritual gifts. And so we're actually going to open up into Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. I'm going to read through that scripture real quick. And so uh, in Romans chapter uh, 12, 6 through 8, we're reading through the NIV version. Uh, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving then serve. If it's teach, then teach. If it is to give, if it is to give, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, do so generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it mercifully. So, um, this uh, uh, back in uh, back in uh, Labor Day at the uh, uh, picnic for the Kyles, there's a famous saying that somebody always gets injured, and it was my turn to get injured again at the Kyles party, and I had made an awesome move, and I had hit the volleyball just right, but when I came down, I came down on the wrong side of my foot, and I had injured my ankle. It, uh, it was an uh, it was an epic hit. And it was an epic hit when I hit the ground. So uh, what happened was I simply went off to the side. And I did what any 45-year-old do. I just start putting ice and heat on it over the next week or so. And it started to get better. It wasn't broken. It was just a pretty bad strain. Well, about two, three weeks ago, I had noticed that it really hadn't healed. Like it had healed probably 80%. But for weeks, it had stayed achy and it really hadn't gone anywhere. So I went to my physical therapist and uh, said, hey, listen, we're, we're not quite there. And he said, you know, you should have healed by now. Um, so we're going to do just a, a little bit of physical therapy on it, and it'll probably push it right past into the healing stage. And so that's essentially what we did. If you, of course, if you've ever been through physical therapy, there's a few things they do to reduce inflammation and then to get the blood moving. But the other part of the equation was the ankle needed to get put through its paces. It needed a workout. 
The muscles needed to be strengthened, and there's only one way to do that, and that's to work them. And it seemed like the more that I cried uncle, the harder it got, uh, uh, especially one specific therapist. The, I was like, man, it's really burning. She's like, oh, great, we need another 10 reps out of you. And the harder it was, uh, the more she seemed to like it. But the other side of it was that after a few short weeks, the, the, muscle, the muscles around that right ankle have fully healed and I'm out of pain without medication. Now, here's the reality. My ankle wasn't going to heal because I told it to. It wasn't going to heal because I watched videos about what healing looks like for an ankle. It wasn't going to heal because the physical therapist just talked nicely to it or told me to do more rest. No, it needed to get strengthened and put through its paces. And the only way to do that was to dive in and to do the hard work. And what I sensed the Holy Spirit saying to me was that there's either individual or an individuals who are here this morning, that it's time that you get off the bench. You're not, your gifts need to get off the bench and need to get back into the work of the ministry. Your gifts are doing no one any good sitting on the sidelines. You know, Paul lays out a pretty simple analysis. He doesn't say if you're good at teaching, you need to study for a few more years on teaching before you teach. He simply says if you're, gonna, if you're good at teaching, teach. If you're good at ministering, minister. If you have God's gift, do it and be strengthened in the doing along the way. So the promise is, is the, the requirement of the Holy Spirit is simply that you, uh, that you re-engage in your gift. And the second piece of it is this, is, is that if you have operated in the same gift for many, many, many years and it's become stale, it's time for a refresher. It's time for maybe a new mentor or a new individual to come into your life and for you to grow in your gifting to learn new ways and new functions with inside of it. No one gets... Uh, people who get better over time increase their ability to, to help within business and within their personal lives by growing and learning and, and experiencing new things. That is the same for your spiritual gift. It's time for you to grow. And there's another promise. If you're waiting for the church to stop doing its work until you decide to re-engage the scriptures are going to tell you otherwise. The scriptures promise that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And most people are like, oh yeah, no, the, the gates of hell aren't going to beat God. But there's that, that verse comes with two promises, not one. He is going to build his church. The second promise is the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the first promise is, is that he's not going to stop building just because you won't engage. I went to many marching band operations this last year uh, for my kids. I, I observe the football games. I'm not a big football game football fan. I, I really uh, I enjoy watching it, but I'm not a big fan. I let Josh and Tyler do all the crazy emotional football stuff for me. I like to watch them squirm and all everybody comment on Facebook. But uh, I was there to simply observe. I never saw a game of football stop because a player wouldn't come off the bench. If you think something's going to stop God building his church because you're frustrated about something the way things went down or etc., I'm here to tell you you're wrong. God is going to build his church. He wants to build it with you and your gifts. And yes, there may be hard moments inside of ministry, but the reality is, is that the great experiences are in the game. The moments of joy are in the game. It's the times spent ministering to others where you receive joy, they receive joy, people experience God closer, and I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, for someone in here, it's time for you to re-engage. Okay, that's done. I've obeyed the Holy Spirit. That's, now we move on to roots, okay? The free part's over. Now we're into the scriptures themselves. So we're moving to the parable of the sower. 
And the parable of the sower that we, that we see in Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to hang out uh, today. In Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower uh, is, where, is where we're going to at. And we're going to focus in on the explanation of the parable of the sower. Uh, so what is a parable? By definition, what a parable is at its base is simply a story that is relatable to the, that is easily relatable to the crowd that's hearing it that explains a spiritual truth, okay? So when we look at this particular parable and the context in which it's written, Jesus is speaking to a group of uh, a mixed crowd. He's got his disciples. If you looked at the early part of Mark chapter 4, he's created a crowd of but his disciples and loyal followers, but also the crowds have come in to hear him teach and preach. And more than likely, they've also been attracted to signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, any individual who is raising the dead, who is uh, uh, making people walk again, opening blind eyes, is probably not going to have a problem attracting a crowd. Um, and so uh, people are coming to hear him. And in this situation, he doesn't teach them directly, but he opens the dialogue in a parable. And so what makes this parable slightly unique, though, as you read through all the parables on your own through the scriptures, what you're going to find is this. Most parables are not explained. This is one unique case where Jesus explains the meaning of the parable to the disciples because they asked of him. And Jesus, is, Jesus goes through and essentially answers and, and privately shares with them what the, what the parable he it just it went through means. And also, by the way, he's like, and by the way, you better get used to parables because you're going to have a few years of it because that's how I am going to be teaching in parables. So we open that dialogue into Mark chapter 4 and we're getting into the actual explanation. And we're going to be looking at verses uh, 13 through 20. And again, I'm reading out of the NIV, and we'll go ahead and move through Jesus' explanation. Starting with verse 13, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? You've got a lot more coming, so you better shape up. The farmer sows the word, and some people are like the seed along the path, along a walking path. There uh, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that, is, that was sown in them. Others, like seed in the rocky soil or the rocky places, hear the word and, and instantly receive it with joy, but they have no root and therefore they last a short time. When trouble and persecution comes become of the word, they quickly fall away. Essentially, they're quickly out the door. As soon as they come in, they come out. Still others, like the seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop, sometimes six, 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So we look at this and, uh, you know, for all the years that I read this scripture, you kind of read it in the order in which Jesus gives it. And really, you've got three soils that don't produce very much. And then you get to that last soil and you're like, oh, it falls on good soil and that's fantastic. But I'd say as I was going through this sermon, I honestly found that the Holy Spirit was leading me towards that good soil and saying, wait a minute, I want you to stop for one minute. This is what I'm after. Now, when we put this into context, it's simply this, that the soil, from a, from a parable perspective, the soil that lands, that has seed that lands on it, it gets the same seed as all the other three soils. But what takes place inside of it is different than all the other ones. The heart is ready. The mind is ready. The word comes in and it produces a harvest. Now, listen, anybody who goes out and plants a crop, it's funny that you gave that testimony given where I'm going to be going with this. Nobody goes out into their field in our society and where we, where we live, plants a seed and hopes to get another seed back. That, that's really bad math if you look at it from an investment perspective. 
Anybody who goes into a garden or into a field is sowing seeds so that they get more than what they put in. Anything else doesn't make a lot of sense. So when Jesus points this out and he says, listen, what I'm after in the good soil is a harvest. I want my word to go in and I want there to be a harvest from what I've put in. I want to put in something and get a lot in return. The various levels are 30, 60, 100 fold return. So what does that mean for you? God is looking for a harvest from you. Every time his word goes in, he's looking for a harvest, for, for that word to have an amazing return inside of your life. What does that amazing return look like? It looks like this. It makes a difference in you. It makes a difference in your behavior, in your demeanor and attitude, and it makes a difference for those around you. In, uh, we're not gonna go there, but in Philippians chapter one, Paul talks about this concept and he says, God's word produced a harvest of righteousness in my life, and you are the beneficiaries of that harvest. So as we're going through this rooted series, a good, uh, God's word lands on good soil, lands inside of a heart and a mind that's ready to receive it and ready to act on it. And when you know it's working right is when you see a harvest of righteousness taking place that affects you, that will affect your family, and will affect the people around you. That's what a harvest of righteousness looks like in God's words. So God is looking for a supernatural return on his word inside of your life. And that's when you know you're rooted and in good soil, that your heart and your mind are right. So you put this into context where we're talking about rooted in our area. We talk, she talked about Plymouth County. It's funny, some of the most record sales uh, from a real estate perspective, okay, I'm a real estate agent, yeah, okay, I'm a nerd, I get it. So we're gonna bring that in. But right now, my son's shaking his head yes, radically over there. So um, anyways, in the last year, we've had some record sales in Plymouth County and in Sioux County of land being sold for farm ground, $25,000, $26,000 an acre. The reason that is is because this area of the country, when a, one seed goes in, it produces a better return than the land maybe 100 miles away. So it becomes more valuable. This crowd would have understood that concept, that I essentially am going to go into my field and different seeds placed in different places will produce a different return. But I want a return which makes each part of the land slightly different. And Jesus, in this context and in other parables, lays out that he's okay with different levels of return, but he's not okay with getting nothing back. He wants his word to go in and change a life. It may change things in different ways for different people, but he's called, his, his expectation is the, that the word will change us, change me and change you. If you go through and look at other parables, there's other two things I want to give you a cliff note version of. Number one is that when God does a work, he wants something more than just what he did to come back as a result of it. This is the only place where he wants a harvest for the work that he's done. The second piece is this, is that when God gives someone stewardship of a thing, he wants a return as well. If he gives you a gift or he gives you an ability, he gives me an ability or a resource, his expectation is that we manage it well to produce a fantastic return for him. Those returns can vary. You know, different gifts, different individuals, different levels of faith, that changes from individual to individual. But God is looking for you to steward what he's given you for a return. So God's looking for a return. He understands economics pretty well, kind of invented it. So now we're talking about what God wants and what God sees, and we see this in different light. All the other soils are compared to the good soil. It's not the other way around. The good soil is the template. That is what he's looking for. So the question is, we've got three other soils to deal with, and I'm only gonna deal with one type of soil. The, probably the type of soil that I relate to the most. 
If, uh, if there were to be a movie made of my spiritual life, I have two guarantees for you about that movie. Number one, the first guarantee, is that no streaming service in the world will pay a dime to see that movie at all whatsoever. You, back in the day uh, when I grew up, this is the movie that would go straight to DVD. And for some of you who are old enough, it would go straight to VHS. Okay, we'll leave that there. But essentially that there's not going to be a lot of interest in, in a movie made on my spiritual life. But the second guarantee I can make of you this is, is that in my life, the thorny ground in my own spiritual life has been the problem. I have been concerned about the things of this world. The uh, different translations say not just the worries of the world, but the world, worries of this age. And also the concern about the deceitfulness of our wealth and also the desires for other things. Essentially what happens is, again, the good soil is the model. It goes into the ground and produces a harvest. But what happens in the thorny ground is there is a root. A root is established. But in the growing process, it's cut off from producing the harvest. Now, I know I have struggled with it, but because Jesus spoke these words 2,000 years ago, I, am not, I know that in this crowd, I'm not the only one. You probably have seen yourself in the same situation where the things of this world distract, blind, keep you from producing what God has called you to do for the harvest that he wants to produce with inside of you. And so, uh, Paul, I'm going to focus in on one of these, which is the concerns and the worries of this age. Listen, we, we face a little different time than the individuals who are hearing this, uh, 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 hearing this uh, information. So when he's speaking to them, their concerns in some ways are probably the same, but in, in some ways are very different from ours. We live in an age of social media, information blasting. You know more about what your friends and family members think than these individuals do. I read tweets from the president of Ukraine who's in a war. These, these people would not understand that sort of concept. We are drowning in people's opinions. We're drowning in their concerns and their worries about what is taking place in their lives. We are adding to, with information, comes also the other things that are being thrown at us from the rest of the world, advertising, etc. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, we're not going to read through that scripture. I don't really have time to go through it. But in Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34, you've got a job to do this week. One, we're worried about the things that are temporary. Things that come and go. What I eat, what I dress, how I look. And the second thing that Jesus challenges us not to worry about is the thing You can't absolutely control it. Don't be overly concerned about it. So he challenges us in two ways, is that some of the worries we struggle with, which are directly related to the thorny soil, is that you're worried about the things that are temporary and you're worried about the things that you can't control. I I find it fascinating that 2,000 years later, psychologists and psychiatrists have spent decades studying these issues and have come to the same conclusions that Jesus. So the thorny soil struggle is that the concerns of this world in our mind grow mind grow more and more and more. And the concern for God's kingdom becomes less and less and less. The temporary and uncontrollable, the eternal and the valuable. And so as you look at your own individual struggle or you see the struggles of those that are around you, I want to walk you through a pretty interesting paradigm. If you take the scriptures in Matthew and kind of combine them, this is what I see, is that God says, listen, as your focus is more on my kingdom, the permanent things, the eternal things, the things that matter the most, the concerns and cares of this world will diminish as a result. And the more you keep staring 
at elections, social media, what you're going to look like, how you might appear to your friends, and everything else, as those things increase, your focus on my kingdom decreases. And the thorns grow. The land becomes more tainted. And what God wants from you, a harvest of righteousness, is being cut off and strangled. So, where does that leave us? A pretty simple analysis. I, I would say this. I, I, I'm a real practical guy. And this is where, as we kind of dive in and I'm kind of starting to come in for a landing, I would say this. Is that what you focus on seems to expand. Not because it wasn't there before, but because as you look hard at it, I, I, if you've ever been through a problem and you've maybe hunkered down and really tried to tackle it yourself and really started putting time and energy and focus into it, have you noticed that you've been able to work through it and what seemed maybe impossible a week ago or a month ago, suddenly you're crossing lines and you're making progress Maybe it's weight loss. Maybe it is your health. Maybe it is your finances. Maybe it's been a relationship that's in a tough place. But as you've given it focus and attention, things get better. I would say to you this, you need to bring that same focus into God's kingdom. Which means that this is you have to be more concerned about what he thinks than what the world thinks. You have to be more concerned about what he wants than what the world wants. And as you focus in on him, I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit is your partner in helping you put the blinders on to the things that don't seem to matter much. We all know that, when we st that at the end of our lives, we stand before God and God alone. We will not stand before an upholster. You'll not stand before a, a, a group of your friends or your enemies. You stand before him alone. Focus more on him now. Let his kingdom expand in your eyes. Get your eyes more on him. And the thorns and the thistles, the Holy Spirit will start ripping through your soil. It'll start tilling things up and start removing it so that as his word goes in, you experience a harvest in your own life that becoming obedient to God becomes easier, that he stretches you and he makes you grow and you, what you do makes a more eternal difference. And lastly, I want to talk about this. You know, one of the objections that people have, especially when Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 6 about the concept of uh, focus on my kingdom and I'll take care of the rest in your life, is the old cliche, which is that, that man, that Jason, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good, right? Who's ever heard that phrase before? Heavenly minded, no earthly good. My mom's way, I'm sure I learned that from my mom. I'm sure I, we're, we're both very practical in our nature and it, it resonates. But as I was looking through the scriptures and I've been looking through the scriptures even this last year, I would say that cliche does not line up with scripture. There's a difference between wanting out of this world sufferings and just waiting for Jesus to take you home and what God's kingdom is. God's kingdom is in you now. It is in this room right now. It is in your marriage. It is in your workplace. Uh, Jesus in his own prayer says, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is asking that God's invisible kingdom penetrate what's going on here just like it is in heaven. So essentially, God's kingdom, as you focus on it, guess what? It affects your marriage. The scriptures speak clearly about your marriage. My marriage to my wife is simple. God's demand of me as a husband is that I lay my life down for her. That, that's real practical, isn't it? That my needs and my wants come secondarily to my wife's needs and wants. And guess what? She does the same. It is a giving relationship where I set what I want aside for her betterment, and she does the same. When you see that in a, in a marriage, that is where love pours through, that I'm here to serve you, I'm here to 
do what, I, I am here to do what you need. And sometimes that means I need to lead. I need to do something that's courageous or I need to set a distraction aside. It's the same for my children. God's called me to steward my children. God revealed to me many years ago that my children don't belong to me. They belong to him. I am going to die. Whether that's tomorrow or whether that's 50 years from now. And God willing, my children will live past me. Their souls belong to him. I don't own them. They won't stand before me on the day of judgment. They belong to him. I'm just a steward. And as a steward, I've got a different challenge. While I love my children and I'm friends with my children, and I, and I, and I love my children, I love hanging out with them, I'm called to, to steward them and to be, there, to be a, a hand of discipline at some times, a hand of provision at others, a hand of wisdom, and a hand of encouragement. Stewardship is different when you look at it from that perspective. That's extremely practical. God calls with inside of his kingdom, with inside of his word, he talks about my work. How does that dynamic change when I work for God and not for men? If you're thinking that you're going to show up for work on Monday morning and I'm working for God, not for this lousy, lazy boss of mine, <laughs> it changes the dynamic. God's kingdom is penetrating a lot of your life. It's just that your focus is on something else. And as you focus on his kingdom, the Holy Spirit comes alongside, and I promise you, he will start tilling up the soil of your heart. It is not 100% up to you to change everything about yourself. The Holy Spirit is simply looking for one act of obedience. He'll take that, and just like he takes the seed and grows it, he can take one act of obedience and make it bigger and do it again and do it again. And do it again. Until six months later, you're looking different on the inside and on the outside. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We'll go ahead and pray here real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that, that Lord, the soil of our heart and our mind can change that we can have things go in a different way. We thank you for your word, that we can be rooted in you. And when we are rooted in you, Lord, it makes a difference in us and others. Father, I pray right now for this congregation as the hearing of the word. Lord, Lord, if I've spoken your word, I pray that it falls on good soil this morning and that, Lord, you would have a harvest inside of our church, uh, for harvest for those people who are watching online. Let your word... Uh, be a powerful element inside of our lives this week. Let it change our minds and direction. Let it give us wisdom when we lack it. But Father God, help each and every person in here this week do the work of focusing more on you and your kingdom and worrying and being concerned less about what this world wants to distract us with. And Lord, we pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jason, for sharing this morning. Um, let's stand together as we, we prepare to dismiss. You know, each time we hear God's word, it's good for us to pray and soak it in and, and reflect on, on what it might mean for us. And so that's really just as we close. It's really, God, what is it, what is it you are asking of me? What is it you want me to do? So this morning, I just want to close in prayer and, and just affirm God's word given to us this morning by Jason. Let's, let's bow our heads together. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, you are a good sower. And Lord, oftentimes you see things in us that we never see. God, there are gifts and talents in this room that are so plentiful that if we would just tap into them, God, you would just do incredible things in us and through us. 
And so, Lord, we just, we, we do truly plead before you humbly and say, God, we, we want to be good soil. And as you plant your seed, the seed of your word, the seed of your love and your wisdom and compassion and all those things that you sow into us, God, that there would be something produced far greater than just what you've sown into us, that you've put it into good soil and it's going to reap double and triple, 30, 60, and 100 times what you've implanted in us, Lord. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the obedience that Jason shared this morning, stepping out and, and obeying what you spoke to him Thursday morning. And God, that we would receive it. And, and even this week, you would give us opportunities to, to think deeply on this and how this applies to us and how we can use this, um, God, to see something produced in us, not because we're so amazing necessarily, but because you're so amazing and you're so good and you have something that you want to do through us. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for this church. Use us this week to accomplish your kingdom work in Siouxland and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to encourage you as you leave this morning, if you're part of Pathways tonight, make sure you come between five and six. Otherwise, we hope that you have a, a wonderful week. Make sure you encourage Jason on the way out. Thank him for giving his time and effort into the message this morning. God bless you. Have a great week.